Hello, LinkedIn. Welcome back to This Is Working, a live show from my house where we talk to business leaders who are taking us through what feels like a real reset in how we do business. Over many years interviewing chief executives and leaders, I've talked to people who feel often very strongly about particular topics. But when you ask them to go on the record or to speak from their company's point of view, they really shy away. That's changed over the years. We've seen more leaders who are willing to embrace uh, tough topics, but none of them come close to our guest today. Today we have on Rose Mercario, the CEO of Patagonia, who has always embraced her activist voice. Patagonia's business is focused on outdoor clothing. And because of that, Mercario has been most vocal on climate change. Now that her business, her employees, and really our entire society are under stress because of this pandemic, she's calling out our government leaders too. Last week, she published a post on LinkedIn, an article on LinkedIn uh, aimed at Congress calling for more worker protections. She wrote this piece for a stronger tomorrow, tomorrow prioritize children, planet, and democracy, talks about the need for childcare, sick leave, and health care for employees. Now, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about how Patagonia does business, how they think about balancing stakeholder versus shareholder requirements, and how she thinks about what her role is for what the company's role is and what the company's role is in society. I want to just take you through some numbers to give you a perspective on the impact COVID-19 has had on the retail industry in particular. So the latest jobs report from BLS show that uh, retail jobs in uh, lost about 2.1 million jobs in April. Clothing retailers made up 740,000 of those jobs. Our own LinkedIn data shows hiring in retail is down more than 28% since last month and about 37% year over year. So retail is an industry that has been hit incredibly hard. And Patagonia is no exception. North America sales have reportedly dropped 50% since they closed 39 stores in March. And Rose has been very vocal on the fact that they won't reopen until she feels like the stores are ready to reopen. And that might not be until June. So with that, I want to bring Rose on. Uh, Rose, thank you so much for joining us. So let's start with, first of all, where are you? Where are we, getting, where are we reaching you today? <laughs> I am in my home office in Calabasas, California. So hi, Daniel. It's great to be on LinkedIn. And it's great to have you here. There are people coming in from all over the world asking <laughs> questions. They're very excited about it. You have a big uh, fan club on LinkedIn. And so we're going to try to get to all their questions. I want to start with one, though, about this article that I mentioned earlier. What drove you to take on this topic of the social safety net. And I think that when people think about Patagonia and where you are most vocal, it's been on outdoor and climate change issues. Mm -hmm. This goes further. You're talking about childcare and the loss of childcare and how we think about working families. So can you walk us through the thinking behind it? Yeah, so so Daniel, you know, we've had on-site childcare at Patagonia for 40 years. So childcare is um, a really important part of what we what we do at Patagonia. And it's really important in terms of supporting working families. And we've seen it. I mean, we've seen the impact that it, ha that it has to have childcare on site. We have gender parity in all levels of management. And I don't think that's a mistake. I think it's because we have on-site childcare. I think when you see something happen like COVID-19, you see the, the real disparity in a safety net for workers that don't have, have paid leave, which, which we get paid leave to our, um, our paternity leave and maternity leave, plus sick time leave. Um, they don't have insurance um, if they lose their job. And, you know, that doesn't create a more just world in a situation like we're in right now. So it, it feels important to me that business leaders step up and, and push on government to say, we need more help for workers who are being disproportionately impacted by, by COVID. And, and we need better long-term policies so that we can, you know, have a better world with, you know, a com communities valuing caregiving, uh, valuing our environment. I mean, to me, these are pretty simple things, but they get really twisted up when it comes to politics. And why those are very important things in society. Why, why do you think that it is important for Patagonia in particular to take on this topic? I mean, the, you talk about we might lose almost half of all childcare capacity. Super important topic. Is this a broadening of Patagonia's voice to start getting into these kind of issues? 
Well, we've we've always been involved in these issues and talking about child care. That's that's nothing new and talking about on site child care. I think that the reason the business needs to be involved in these issues is because they employ people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they employ humans and families. And so they there needs to be a connection to these issues. If your workers are stressed out because you know, they can't find childcare or they don't have, you know, proper medical care, you know, that that's not going to make for a thriving workforce and a thriving economy and, and a sense of capitalism that thrives. And, and I don't think, I don't think it's, I don't think we have to separate business from life. I mean, business is life and it's made up of people. And so I, I don't think we, you know, you see it in other countries because we have businesses all over the world. Other countries are handling this much better than we are right now because, you know, they have better health care, they have better safety nets. And and so I, I I think it's important for all American businesses to start talking about these issues. When you uh, think about how, what issues you're going to tackle and how you were going to put Patagonia's voice out there, um, when we've seen Patagonia take a really strong and aggressive stance on on so many issues over the years, it's been during boom times. It's times mm-hmm. when everything's growing and the economy's doing great and Patagonia's doing really well. How are you balancing right now the question of when to focus on how much you need to focus on the business and making decisions based on the business interests versus these kind of questions of doing things that are right for the employees or for society? Has anything changed in how you do business considering this kind of massive downturn we're going through? Yeah, I mean, to us, those issues have always been inextricably linked, right? If we protect the planet, we protect ourselves. If we protect our community, we protect ourselves. Uh, so standing up for those issues, it's nothing new. It's, it, it, it is more intensified, I think, by what's happening with COVID, but it's it's not like we have to choose one or the other. We can do both. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. And and I think it's more important than ever that we do it now. You know, we have to change our focus, right? Because COVID-19 has affected every business, but it, it just means we need to sharpen our focus. And the way I think about this whole process that we're going through right now as a business is really in three sections, which is stabilize, recover, reimagine. Hmm. Because if you don't reimagine your business post COVID, right, you're not paying attention. The world will change without you. So it's, it's, I think it's a really, it's actually a really fruitful time for us to really look at everything we're doing as a business and ask, you know, the whys and look at how we simplify and move on. Um, and, and yeah, that's the way I, I view the crisis. I mean, it has so much suffering associated with it, death, illness, joblessness. Um, and still we have to look at what we can do. What are the right actions that we can take right now to make the world better for the long haul? Right. Yep. Uh, we just want to. We have Rose Macario here from Patagonia. This is this is working. If you have questions, please leave them in the comment stream. We have people here from Nashville, the Ukraine, Dallas, New Jersey, Paris, Turkey. So they're all over the world tuning in. Uh, I want to talk about that last subject you brought up. You talked about this kind of three stages. Uh, and one of them is reimagine. What kind of reimagining are you doing for Patagonia? What will the company look like as we get through this? Well, you know, we're going through this process right now and and all of the all of the people in our company are looking at each of the functions that they do and they're saying, how can I reimagine this given everything that I've learned from COVID and given the values of the company, which is to save our home planet. And and I'm I, I don't have all the answers yet because we haven't finished the exercise, but I'm excited about it because I think that there will be a lot of great ideas that will will bubble up. Uh, from from our colleagues, and and I think all of us need to go through a process of of not only reimagining our businesses but reimagining our lives and and how we move forward, um, given everything we know and everything we've experienced, and in, including the inequities, including the difficulties that that some people are having, and creating a more just world as we move forward. 
what, what kind of advice would you give to business leaders or people who are starting their own company or want to have a, uh, an impact on their companies? And they want to have this kind of reimagining process go on. I think for so much of us, we're just trying to figure out how to get to tomorrow or maybe what, <laughs> can we go back to the office? Um, so uh, we just had Sarah Blakely on. This is working last uh, two weeks ago. One of the things she talked about was she called out uh, to all employees at Spanx. They all had to come up with product ideas. What are the new mm -hmm. products that are going to be a requirement for workers in the next couple of years or for people, for customers in the next couple of years? And that kind of asking for reimagining from the bottom up mm -hmm. uh, was something uh, a lot of people said, I'm going to start practicing this in my own company. I'm curious, what kind of what are you asking of your leaders and of people all across the company is how they are supposed to be reimagining. How do you go through that exercise? Well, we're we're democratizing it as as um, completely as we can, and it it will go to all, all levels. And we're asking uh, functional leaders to hold hold meetings and explore some of these questions and basically get the ideas all together. You know, um, everyone has great ideas. Everyone's having an experience, a particular experience, and everyone manages different functions or businesses within the company. And so I, I feel like the more you make it, uh, democratize it, the more simple you make the process. I think we, we just asked maybe four questions. Um, I think the, the better sort of pro overall process that you'll have, uh, because you'll, you'll get a, a, a more diversity of ideas and, um, and I think that's what, what we're looking for during this time. It also helps people, you know, we've all been going through a, a really rough time over the last, you know, eight weeks. If we've had to shut down our companies or we've had to, you know, furlough people. It's, it's really hard on people. And I think giving them an opportunity to think about the future right now and a better future and a more just future and a future where we're more focused in on the things that we value uh, as a company. I think it's, it's an exciting, that can be an exciting time it coming out of a very dark time. Yeah. Uh, it means thinking way beyond just business continuity. It means really reimagining how you are, uh, how, how you're doing business. The question came in from Andy about specifically about uh, how Patagonia is organized right now. And he asked, what percent of Patagonia's employees work from home pre-COVID versus today? And then how are you thinking about a work from home policy in the future? Is this a temporary thing that we're going through or is this going to become part of Patagonia's culture? Well, you know, we've always, we've, we've, we've never had anyone really working from home. It was very, very rare, you know, because we always think of ourselves as like a family and a community and we want to be together. And, and that's also why we have on-site childcare, you know, to provide that um, sense of community. So it's been very strange for us to work from home. So almost 0% were working from home before. And now it's about, oh, it's about a hundred percent in our corporate office. Um, and um, and and that's been a huge change for us, but but there's also been benefits that have come from it too. So I think we're we're learning from the the process just like everyone else is. I mean, it's interesting as a leader, right? Because I've never had the experience of putting out an idea to my team and seeing all of their reactions at once. <laughs> that's a great point, right? All the and in you some ways, that's been very good. Yeah. <laughs> so does that change how you? get a sense of whether something is landing or not you're, yeah, totally, you're, you're totally monitoring the little chat heads and seeing yeah i mean it, it is i mean i think everybody is finding this right now right it's a very different way of working and and we're all trying to adapt to it but what we've learned is that we we have adapted to it and um there are thing other things that are more difficult when you're creating product which we do at our corporate office so there is a reason to be in the office to to go to a fitting or, you know, to use our R and D facility and things like that. But, but for now um, we're adjusting to, to working from home. Great. Rose Mercario on this is working. I want to read some comments coming in from the stream. Uh, Risa says treating employees like full humans. Exactly. Tammy <laughs> Kocher says, I love the stability recover and reimagine. Wow. It's so visionary, huge fan of your product. Um, and Christine says, couldn't agree more, Rose. I'm not sure how we rationalize prioritizing business over people. If we're attempting to sell services, products to people, we must value humanity and we can do meaningful business and experience uh, sustainable growth, which leads to a, a great question from Scott Erickson, who says, how is Patagonia's 1% 
for the planet affected by the recession and maybe worse that we are going through. Right. So our 1% for the planet giving, which is that we give 1% of our sales, not our profits, 1% of our sales every year to grassroots environmental organizations. And we will do that this year. And it's, it's written into our corporate charter that we will do that whether we make money or whether we don't make money. Um, we consider it um, our earth tax. We consider it, um, you know, penance for, for the damage we do as a business to the planet, and we'll continue to do it. It'll be less, obviously, because our revenue will be less. Yep. Uh, question from Lisa. How can anyone in brick and mortar restart? Is it even possible for a small business owner? Like you were a, a CFO uh, when you came into Patagonia. You were in private equity before. You have seen how businesses run, uh, all kinds of different businesses. What advice would you give to small business owners right now? Well, I think the the way we're looking at it, I mean, I think small business owners have been the hardest hit with without question. Um, you know, they they need to go in and get their cash flow every week. It's super important. Um, without that, um, you know, it can be devastating. And I, I think there's going to need to be something done with commercial rents and rents in general for for people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that what we're trying to do is just create really good protocols for bringing people back um, into the business and making them feel safe when they come into our space, but also having fun and giving them a good experience, right? We want we want people to still be engaged in the important issues that, that um, are about protecting the planet, it, whatever your business is, you can engage um, your community and your customers um, in your work. Um, but you know, the, the reality is there is a big shift to digital. There, there has been. Um, I don't think brick and mortar is going away. I think it will survive, um, mm -hmm. but it will look. It, it might look a little bit different. Uh, and what about supply chains? Are you thinking, a question from Allison Engel, great one, how have your supply chains been changed by this? I know we've talked to a number of people, including Ray Dalio, who said he expects supply chains to be much more focused on uh, near sourcing, getting things that you don't have to worry about trying to get stuff from overseas. You don't have to worry about shipping. Can it be made by someone in the factory nearby? Are you thinking, how does that impact Patagonia? Oh, yeah. I mean, our supply chains have been in fa impacted because almost every apparel company were you know, is, is being, is being um, impacted with downward um, projections. But I also think that, you know, we're still continuing to focus on the things that are important to us. You know, we're growing, we're growing hemp in a joint venture in, in Denver. We're, 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 um, we're working on regenerative organic cotton fields to help sequester more ca carbon. You know, we're continuing the innovation in our supply chain because it's it's really important for the future um, and to have more environmentally um, productive products and so we're we're still focused on that. Um, I don't think we'll see the longer term effects in the supply chain for like another six months, honestly, because I think people are still adjusting their forecasts and trying to understand what their business is going to do. But you think there will be some long-term impacts on supply chain? I do. And I think some suppliers will go away, honestly, you know, and, and I think some will survive. And it's sort of the same with, you know, every business that's out there. Uh, I want to ask you some uh, a question about how you personally are managing through this. Uh, I know that you are well known for um, being uh, a really thinking through compassion and empathy with your employees. And you have talked about the fact that you, uh, at the beginning and end of every day, you meditate what's been the, how has this hit you personally? How has it changed how you lead and how you think about listening to your employees and customers? Well, like I said earlier, you know, there's, there's no sort of end to the suffering in a public health crisis. And, you know, people are dealing with deaths in their family that are related to COVID. People are dealing with, you know, you know, joblessness, um, Every CEO I know who's been, their business has been materially affected, has had to tell a lot of bad news hmm. to their to their employees. And, you know, we love our employees. We love our colleagues. It's very, very hard to, to face, you know, putting them in a situation where they're suffering because they're worried about, you know, will they come back to work and what will that look like? And, and the only thing I can say about that is just, 
you know, I try and use everything to grow, right? Even the difficult situations, you have to try and use everything to grow. And, um, and this is a situation where you really have to grow your compassion and, and you, you have to, to give your whole attention to it, um, your whole self to it, your whole sense of curiosity so that you can sort out what are the right actions to take. And, and sometimes that might feel like a conflicting priority because you've got to save the business. And then in saving the business, you're, you're hurting people that you care about and that have been your colleagues. And, and I, I think that's, you know, for me, meditation has been sort of my, my groundwork for, for dealing with, with cultivating my compassion. Some people might do it by raising children or doing sports or any other, you know, form, but that's the form that I use. And, and I find it very um, helpful in a, in a time like this when we're dealing with a lot of adversity. And you have been practicing all of these methods for a long time for your teams, they might not have been. What do you do to make sure that people are also thinking through how to be compassionate? Because it's not just you making these decisions. There's other people in way down in the organization that have to make decisions uh, at lower levels too that are going to hurt people or yeah. have, have an impact. So how do you pass that this kind of wisdom on? One of the things that, that we did through the um, the process when we had to go through through furloughs ourselves was we said, you know, what what will our employees need. Some of them have never had to file for unemployment before, you know, so, so we developed a training for them to help them through that. Um, we, we helped our managers who had to, had to do the furloughs themselves. And we, we helped them understand, you know, what kind of predicament that the person that they were talking to was going to be in and how to do that in a way um, that was human and compassionate. And I think that, um, the, the best thing that you can show your colleagues during a time like this is that we care about you, you know, and that you are still part of our community and that you're still part of our, our, our group of colleagues and, and we care about what happens to you. And I think that, you know, I, I, you know, I've heard stories of people getting a text message that they were, you know, that they were furloughed. I mean, I think that's terrible. We, we, we had personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with every person. Uh, I have a question here from Mitch Morris, who says, thank you, Rose. Curious, what's keeping you up at night right now? What are your biggest concerns as head of Patagonia <laughs> and as a citizen of the world? Big question, what is it? Yeah, I mean, what's keeping me up at night um, is is the climate crisis, um, is, is um, you know, I think one thing this, this whole um, epi pandemic has taught us, right, is that science is really important and you should listen to scientists. And that's true in the climate crisis too. And so people who don't listen to scientists scare me. <laughs> I worry about that. I worry about that for the safety of my employees, honestly, when we think about reopening. Um, and, you know, I, I, I worry about the longer term issues of the climate crisis and, and, um, and the destabilization of um, of an America that doesn't have a very good sa social safety net, and and we're we're seeing it writ large right now. When you talk about the safety of your retail employees, you mean people coming into the stores who won't wear masks or not taking precautions? Yeah, I'm concerned about that. I mean, we've seen it in 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 um, some some businesses that have already started to reopen, and um, and I worry about that because I, I don't want I don't want my employees to be um, unnecessarily exposed to anything um, you know during a, a global pandemic so what are you putting into place to give employees the the sense that they, they have some agency here and they can do something about it yeah we're, we're working on our opening procedures right now Daniel and they're really thorough and we're going to ask our customers to wear masks and um, we're, we're working through all the steps to reopen and we're gonna do it very cautiously as we sort of watch and learn um, as, as others reopen. 
Excellent. We are on uh, for This Is Working. We've got Rose Mercario here coming in from uh, California. And I want to uh, finish off with a, a couple notes here from some comments from people who are just saying how much they appreciate your humanity here. Congratulations to you and all your employees for showing integrity and living the Patagonia brand value. No matter the situation, that's leadership at its best and making a little like, uh, you know, uh, flexing, <laughs> flexing emoji. Patagonia supply chain transparency is aspirational. Thank you, Patagonia. You create impact. You inspire impact. You pursue impact that comes from Adam Babel. Um, Rose, any thoughts about the you you told the New York Times we are going to be you were the first to close down, one of the earliest to close down, you were going to be one of the last to reopen. Are you feeling pressure to reopen sooner? Or are you still committed to that kind of a, a time frame? You know, Daniel, our, our digital business is doing really well right now. Um, and that's an environment that we can control really well. Um, our, our retail stores are really going to be dependent on what happens regionally. And we have stores all around the world. Um, and some of them are on different timelines than others. Um, you know, we'll, we'll open in regional areas when we feel like we have a good plan um, and we have, you know, good information on um, reopening that won't put our employees, um, you know, at risk, at unnecessary risk. Yeah. All right. And I want to finish with one last question. I hate to put you on the spot. If you know these answers, I would love to hear. What are, you mentioned that there were four questions you were asking and for the reimagining part. Do you know what those are? You Can you share what those four questions are? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm not going to remember them all right now. All right. Um, great they're, basically, they yeah, they're basically about how does this help us focus on our mission more? What can we do? And uh, and how has um, how has COVID um, what are the lessons that you've learned from COVID? And uh, there's a couple other questions in there that I can't remember right now. So. All right. Well, at some point, if you want to post those, I'm sure you'll get a lot of people who want to copy them or learn from them. Uh, Rose, thank you so much for joining us here today and being so open and honest with your uh, You got it. It's hey, Daniel, terrific. I want to say one more thing. Sure. We are going to get through this. It will get behind us someday. But right now, we're writing history and we can choose a better world and we can choose a more just world and we can choose a world that values caregiving and that values the planet. And it's our choice to make. And I think in some ways, maybe um, this this pandemic is, is making it more possible for us to make those changes sooner, to have a real just form of capitalism. Well, that is a great and optimistic ending to this, uh, Rose. I am not surprised that is how we ended this. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, Daniel. Uh, want to just thank everyone for leaving your comments and your questions and for tuning in from all over the world to uh, listen and talk to Rose. Really appreciate it. Come back next week. We are going to have DJ D-Nice uh, on live. We'll talk about how he came up with his idea to start doing global DJing sessions on Instagram and what, kind, what that has brought him and just everything behind the new business of virtual parties. You can always follow at LinkedIn News, follow LinkedIn News to be alerted whenever we go live. Um, leave your questions, leave your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. We will put this up as a podcast over the weekend, and I'll write an excerpt. So if you follow me, Daniel Roth, on LinkedIn, you'll also be alerted. If you follow my newsletter, this is working. You'll get a notification, and you'll get it in your inbox. So please subscribe to that. Thanks, everyone. As Rose said, we are writing history here, and you are the ones doing the writing. Uh, can't wait to see how and what you are writing. See you next week.